By the time we get to Genesis chapter 22, this Sunday's Old Testament reading, Abraham and God have gone through a lot together. I thought a timeline might help us to visualize how the relationship between God and Abraham has unfolded over time. So I found this timeline on the web and I've starred in red some of the key events we've looked at that have marked Abraham's life. At Numbers 1 and 2, God first calls Abraham to leave his home and follow him and promises him the land of Canaan. At Numbers 6 and 7, he promises Abraham that he will have a son and that his offspring will be as numerous as the stars. At number eight, Ishmael is born to Abraham and Hagar, thanks to the scheme hatched by Sarah. As we saw last week, Hagar and Ishmael will eventually be sent away, although Ishmael, as Abraham's son, will also have a multitude of descendants. The promise to Abraham of having descendants too numerous to count is reiterated at number nine, and the covenant reaffirmed at number 11, where Abraham is told that it is Isaac exclusively who will inherit all of God's promises. At number 13, an episode we do not cover in our Old Testament readings, God confers with Abraham about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the land where Abraham's nephew Lot elected to live and raise his family. The people there have become so corrupt and evil but the Lord has decided to destroy both towns. But Abraham intercedes at length with the Lord. By this time, Abraham has come to know God's character, and it's on that basis that he pleads with the Lord to spare some of the souls there. He says to God, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away? and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord agrees. If fifty righteous people can be found, he will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham continues to plead bringing the number at last down to ten people. If just ten righteous people can be found, will God spare the city? And God agrees. All this takes place before the event we read about last week, which is number 14 on the chart. God's promise of a son is at last fulfilled to Abraham and Sarah. Isaac is born. And that brings us to today's reading, number 15, where God tests Abraham and asks him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. While I explain a bit about our reading in Genesis 22, I would like you to take a good look at the sacrifice of Isaac as envisaged by Caravaggio in 1602. Genesis 22 makes for some heart-wrenching reading. Sometime later it says, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, Here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Indeed, it's a mind-boggling passage, an unheard-of demand that God seems to be making. God is asking him to sacrifice Isaac, the son he has waited for for so long, whom he adores, who is the repository of all his hopes and dreams and the Lord's promises. How can God ask him to do that? And what is the real nature of this test? If Abraham obeys, what does that prove? Does God want to make sure that Abraham will now respond robotically, mechanically, because he has finally learned to do what he is told? I don't think so. We're told several times in Scripture that Abraham is God's friend, a unique title that no one else in the Bible receives. There is genuine love between God and Abraham, which has been built up over years of adventures and misadventures on the part of Abraham. When Abraham pleaded with God not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he did it on the basis of the character of God. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Far be it from you to destroy the righteous with the wicked. 
He knows from years of experience that God's heart, his friend's heart, is righteous and merciful and loving. So on that basis, when God asks him to make the ultimate sacrifice, he knows that somehow this will come to a conclusion born of love. As father and son climb Mount Beriah, with Isaac carrying the wood for the sacrifice on his back, he asks Abraham, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham replies, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. This is what God wanted to find out when he decided to test Abraham. Does Abraham know how much I love him? Does he know that he can trust me completely because of who I am? Does he really know me? And the answer is yes. What Abraham does not know is that hundreds of years later, on this very mountain, which is said to be the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, God's own son will carry wood on his back, as Isaac did, but in the shape of a cross. And that son will be the sacrificial lamb who lays down his life for us all. But that is yet to come. Here we have Caravaggio, the master of chiaroscuro, light and dark freeze-framing Abraham as he draws the knife for the sacrifice. Our eyes naturally follow the light from left to right, across the shoulder of the angel and down his arm, over the hand of the angel and over the hand of Abraham holding the sharpened knife, onto the naked shoulder and the face of Isaac, pinned under his father's strong hand. And this stops us in our tracks. While the angel and Abraham have been exchanging glances and the angel gestures toward the ram on the right, Isaac, unaware of what is transpiring above him, is looking directly at us in horror. Suddenly, we are implicated in the action. It is as if Isaac is screaming at us for help and asking us the question, are you going to let them do this to me? And we notice that unlike the other two figures whose hands are all engaged in the drama, Isaac's hands are unseen because they are bound behind his back. What can we do? But it's then that our, our gaze follow the light upwards to the head of the ram, whose eye is so gentle and expression so meek that we immediately know that God has provided a solution. This ram is the willing sacrifice. He seems ready to let his own head take the place of Isaac's. Our eyes follow the ram's gaze up to the shiny bald head of Abraham and back to the angel. We're drawn into their wordless exchange and we sense a bit of resolution the moment of God's provision has come. This extraordinary passage in the book of Genesis, because of its high drama and because of all the elements contained in it, became the subject of the most famous competition in art history. The year was 1401, 200 years before the work of Caravaggio, and the place was Florence, Italy. As we've mentioned in an early episode, the city-states that existed in what we now call Italy were frequently at war with one another. And when they were not at war with one another, they were trying to outdo whatever a rival city had done or created. The city of Pisa had created a magnificent cathedral with gorgeous bronze doors. The Florentines wanted to have bronze doors too. At the end of the 13th century, Florence had begun building an entirely new cathedral to replace the old one, and work on the church went on for 140 years, through wars, plagues, and so on. Meanwhile, Siena, one of Florence's most bitter rivals, had started work on a cathedral that would be even bigger than the one being built in Florence. 
So the Florentines had to find ways to make their cathedral and its ancient baptistry even more impressive, even if it was smaller. One part of that plan would include the creation of three sets of bronze doors for the baptistry. The other part would include the creation of a dome that would be higher and bigger than anyone had ever seen. That's the dome you see in this image of the cathedral. But at the time we're talking about, in 1401, no one had yet figured out how to build the dome that was called for in the architectural scheme. So the cathedral was without a dome. And the solution to that problem would have to wait. For now, they wanted to have the bronze doors for the baptistry that would put the doors of Pisa in the shade. One set of bronze doors was completed in 1336. But then everything ground to a halt as the plague and warfare prevented further work being done. Here is the baptistry, which was centuries old, even in 1401. And here you see it in relation to the cathedral itself and its bell tower designed by Giotto. Everybody who was anybody was baptized here. Dante, the Medici family, future popes, and so on. Let's take a look at it from the air. At that time, all business in Florence was done through guilds that represented and regulated all of the professions. And because Florence was famous for the cloth that was produced there, it was the very powerful guild of cloth manufacturers who spon sponsored a competition to see who could design the most beautiful second and third sets of doors to complete the work on the baptistry. The contestants had each to submit a bronze panel in the shape of a barbed quatrefoil depicting the sacrifice of Isaac. And the panel had to include every element mentioned in the scripture. Abraham, Isaac, the angel, the two servant boys that accompanied father and son to Mount Moriah, the donkey that carried the wood and other supplies, and the ram, which would be the substitutionary sacrifice. A number of artists competed, but the contest finally came down to two men. Filippo Brunelleschi, whom we have met before when we talked about his discovery of linear single point perspective, and Lorenzo Ghiberti, a younger man, but a rising star. Here are the panels each produced. I don't want to take up too much of your time today, so I'll stop now and we will take up the discussion of the two panels and the sacrifice of Isaac again next week. In the meantime, you can try to decide which one you like best and which one you think the judges chose. <laughs>